Welcome back everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about someone very special in the field of Islamic studies who studied at Harvard University, who was a professor there, who got his PhD at Princeton, who talked about a particular part of Islamic history that is a little bit, um, is a little bit embarrassing, a little bit hidden under the rug, particularly in modern times. But that wasn't always the case. I am talking about someone called Dr. Shahab Ahmed. Dr. Shahab Ahmed was well known for his many published works, but in particular, his work on the satanic verses. So for those of you who don't know, there are narrations and traditions going back supposedly to Muhammad, where when he was leading the prayer in front of an audience, that consisted of Muslims, Kafir, unbelievers, and jinns, while he was reciting Surah Al-Najm, which is Surah 53. When he got to Ayah 21, according to the histories and according to Islamic scholars, Muslims used to believe that the Satan threw words into, into Muhammad's mouth as he was reciting, and he recited the validity of the intercession of three different gods from Allah. Alat, Aluza, and Manat. And supposedly when he did this, he did this because he wanted to make sure that people would come to Islam, their hearts were hardened, they weren't listening to him, the pagans weren't having anything to do with him. If only he could say something that they would relate with, that would resonate with these pagan people, and so it would encourage them to come closer to Islam. And this is why when Satan threw the words into Muhammad's mouth, he didn't seem to resist enough to stop it, and so he actually said those words. Once Muhammad had finished reciting Surah Al-Najm, and he had had the satanic verses interjected into it, both the Muslims and the pagans, and supposedly the jinns, all prostrated afterwards as a sign of accepting what Muhammad had said. So what Muhammad had wanted, which was to draw the pagans into Islam, happened. They, they were more sympathetic now that Muhammad had mentioned their gods as being valid intercessors. Now supposedly, according to this tradition, Later, the angel Jibreel comes to Muhammad and tells him that he has erred, he has made a grave mistake by reciting something that wasn't actually from Allah, it was from Shaitan. He just wasn't able to tell the difference at the time and therefore he recited the satanic verses they had made its way into the Quran. And then Jibreel then tells Muhammad that this is what actually should have been there. And so from that point on, Muhammad corrects the mistake and it's all good. Everyone goes back to being normal. Now, Muslims universally reject this because it in effect contradicts modern doctrine. Shahab Ahmed, in his book Before Orthodoxy, The Satanic Verses in Early Islam, points out that modern understandings of theology from an Islamic perspective hold the idea that the prophets could not err in their recitation of the Quran. In other words, for the past 200 years or so, it's been a common Islamic belief that all of the prophets could never have mistaken when they were giving their recitation from Allah. They, they were ineffable. They could not fail to do so. Everything was perfect. There is no question about it. And of course, if you believe that doctrine, that modern doctrine, you then have the issue that you can't accept the story that many early Muslims accepted that was rampant in the early Islamic community, that Muhammad was leading prayer, reciting Surah Al-Najm, and when it came to Ayah 21, he said something that encouraged the intercession of three different gods, which seems like a big, a big mistake. So in Dr. Shahab Akhmag's book, Man, I need to learn how to pronounce your name. So in Dr. Shahab Ahmed's book, he goes through 50 different rawiya or narrations that we know today were at some point in early acceptance among the Islamic community. He gives his own epistemological understanding of how he derives to his conclusion that the early Muslim community believed this was a genuine narration and did actually happen. Now, Dr. Shahab Ahmed doesn't say that he believes this event actually took place, but rather he says that based on the evidence, he believes the early Muslim community believed that it took place. And he bases this off 50 different narrations, 50 different reports that we have that go back to some of the earliest companions before the second century, AH. In fact, when Dr. Shahab Ahmed talks about how he sees this as being valid, he points out that during the second half of second of the second century AH, there began a what you can loosely call the Hadith project, in which scholars were coming together to formulate prescriptive, legalistic, and authoritative Hadith collections that would be valid legalistically and as part of the Sharia. And through that project, they wanted to make sure that they had the, the best way of being able to know whether or not a particular narration goes all the way back to the companions or to Muhammad himself. And that's where we understand, that's where we get the concept of the Hadith science, the, the Isnad, the idea that something is Sahih, the idea that something is Da'if and, and so on and so forth. But as Dr. Shahab Ahmed points out, this in effect was a 
late second century invention. This didn't exist as a concept, as a way of validating these isnads. Before then, Sahaba, the Tabi'un, people who had their own narrations with their own chains, they were perfectly happy not having this kind of standard to. The earliest communities of Muslims did not have the same rigorous standards as the later generations of Muslims. Dr. Shahab Ahmed points out that, ironically, the earlier a narration is, the more likely it is to precede the Hadith project, of which we came up with the science of Hadith with the Isnads, with Sahih and not Sahih and Hassan and Daif, this is good, this is bad, and so on. And instead, the worse narrations you have are more support for their early acceptance within the community. In other words, by historical standard, we tend to go with the earlier sources, but the earlier sources are the ones that are weaker in Isnads than the later sources. So there's this contentious paradoxical position Muslims are in, where on the one hand they want to use the science of Hadith to validate different Hadith, but that by definition means that they are actually some of the later Hadith, which are less reliable historically because they come many years, if not decades or hundreds of years later than the earliest Hadith, but the earliest hadith doesn't have the science of hadith, it has incomplete isnads or unreliable isnads. So which one do you take? Dr. Shahab Ahmed falls on the perspective that it's irrelevant whether or not the satanic versus event actually happened, but rather what's important is that the, the earliest companions of Muhammad believed that it did. He goes on to say that all of the evidence we have says that for the first 200 years, the idea that Muhammad recited satanic verses was fully accepted without question. It was only in the last 200 years of the modern period that Muslims started to universally reject this incident as being inauthentic and did not happen. I think this goes to show you just how much Islam has changed. Islam, how it was originally with the earliest companions of Muhammad, had radical different beliefs than the ones that than the Muslims that are around today. The Muslims around today have developed additional doctrines that just aren't supported by the earliest evidence. The earliest evidence that we have means either one of two things. Either the earliest companions genuinely believed that Muhammad recited satanic verses and that Jibreel corrected him, or the Islamic community was just a bunch of liars. The Islamic community could not resist making up lies about Muhammad universally for 200 years after Muhammad died. And I think both of those positions for Muslims are untenable. Muslims won't accept that Muhammad, that the Sahaba was believing that Muhammad recited Islamic verses. Muslims won't believe that the Sahaba was making mass fabricated lies about their own prophet. But unfortunately, you have to pick one of these two because all of the evidence, as Dr. Shahab Ahmed points out, goes in that direction. What do you do when some of the greatest historians of Islam some of the earliest historians of Islam. In contrast with Christianity, we don't have such an idea. There, there is no Christian tradition of which Jesus recited satanic verses. There is no tradition of which Jesus did anything like the saw. In fact, Jesus was pure, holy, just as the Quran says he's holy, sinless, just as the Hadith say he's sinless, and beyond reproach. Muhammad, on the other hand, never was seen this way by Muslims, early Muslims anyway. The Sahaba didn't think that Muhammad couldn't sin. The Quran says he could sin. They saw him rather as a flawed character that God had put in a specific position that elevated him and gave him protection in case he did sin. So when he recited satanic verses, according to, again, Dr. Shahab Ahmed, his perspective on this and his conclusion is that, well, actually, they saw this as a hero story, that Muhammad was this figure who struggled deeply in getting the pagans to come to Islam who wanted to take shortcuts in doing so, so he mentioned their three other gods, Alat, Aluza, and Manat, as valid intercessors in Surah Anajim. And then Jibril chose to come in and to help him from Allah to get him to correct the mistake he had made. In other words, yeah, it's a, it's a hero narrative. Muhammad, according to the Sahaba, wasn't a sinless character beyond reproach. He was someone who frequently erred. That was a good thing because it showed how much Allah had favored him by sending Jibreel to help him. This is, of course, anathema to Muslims today because Muslims today can't acknowledge what actually happened historically and what the earliest companions believed about their prophet. This isn't a fringe position either. This seems to have been widespread perspective on exactly what Muslims believed about Muhammad. Come to Jesus Christ. Come to the way, the truth, and the life, the one of whom is beyond reproach who would never and has never recited satanic verses, the one who loves you from before you were born, the one who is God, taken unto himself the fullness of humanity, who died so that you could be atoned for in all of the sins that we are guilty of. Come to Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Have a great day.